All rise. Court Appeals Division 1 is now in session. Please be seated. This is the time set for oral argument in 1 CAUB 210148, Mahoue v. Arizona Department of Economic Security. Counsel, we have read the briefs in this matter. We've conferenced it in conference today. Both sides have 20 minutes to present argument. If you wish to reserve time, it's your responsibility to do that on your own. When you approach the podium, if you would announce your name. And with that information, Counsel, you may begin. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Amanda Caldwell. I'm the Managing Attorney of the Yuma Office and the Farm Worker Program at Community Legal Services. And I, along with my co-counsel, Danielle Morales and Nina Targovnik, represent the appellant, Roger Mahoue, in appeal of his pandemic unemployment assistance benefits. I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. My client, Mr. Mahoue, is a 62-year-old black man from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. For nearly six years, he made his living as a gig worker, an Uber driver, throughout metropolitan Phoenix, until he quit his job as a direct result of COVID-19. Mr. Mahoue applied for pandemic unemployment assistance, and he represented himself, pro se, at both the hearing and the board. And as such, a central theme in our arguments today will be access to justice. Access to justice is implicated in both his qualification under the CARES Act and his arguments regarding his due process rights. I'd like to begin discussing Mr. Mahoue's eligibility under the CARES Act. The CARES Act was passed to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic. Mahoue was a covered individual in that he was unemployed, partially unemployed, unavailable, or unable to work because of at least two qualifying reasons. The first reason that Mr. Mahoue is able to qualify for pandemic unemployment assistance is because he quit his job as a direct result of COVID-19. Mr. Mahoue is an adult with a serious health condition, namely asthma, and his asthma is aggravated by viruses. He also was working, as I said, a gig worker, and he was unable to physically or socially distance. Those two facts compelled Mr. Mahoue to quit his job due to COVID-19. There is no requirement that a medical doctor advise Mr. Mahoue to quarantine, and Mr. Mahoue is able to show that his quit is a direct result of the pandemic. Direct results should be broadly construed under state law, and it should encompass the natural consequences of an effect. If not for COVID-19, Mr. Mahoue would not have quit his job. His asthma alone was not enough. The fact that there was no mask requirement either by his employer or by the state of Arizona was not enough. This court's own decision in Simmons v. Arizona is instructive in this case. Mr. Mahoue's serious health condition created a heightened risk of exposure, and there was no procedural safeguards in place for him to take advantage of. Mr. Mahoue is able to show that he had an elevated risk of exposure, and that under state law, he had good cause or compelling personal reason to quit. Counsel, what about the ALJ's discussion and or findings that those concerns could be alleviated through various measures like wearing a mask, wearing his own mask, and also rolling down the windows, and also the 
ALJ's perception, at least, that, that passengers would wear masks as well. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, there was no requirement to wear masks at that time, and the email um, that the appellant, Mr. Mahiwe, received from Uber was only recommendation. So passengers were not required to wear masks to ride with Uber, and he, exer he could exercise very little control over who came into his cab. If he drove to pick up a job and someone refused to put on a mask, he's out money because of that job. And so the circumstances there compelled him to quit his job because of COVID-19. The statute says that he, that he has to quit as a direct result. Um, what work, if any, does the word has do in the statute? I th Mr. Mahiwe uh, did quit his job as a direct result of COVID-19. Um, the, the CARES Act was passed and it, um, and it allowed for, person, uh, for a claimants to apply for benefits anytime between January 27th, 2020 and, and September 21st, uh, I'm sorry, September 4th of 2021. Mr. Mahiwe did not um, quit his job in January. He did not quit his job in February. But when the former governor, Doug Ducey, came out with his executive order 2020-18, the stay at home order, uh, Mr. Mahiwe then quit his job because the guidance at the time required individuals with serious health conditions to stay home. And Mr. Mahiwe has provided records that are in the order which show that his serious health con condition is aggravated by viruses. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I think has to quit because of the pandemic indicates that he was compelled to do so because of the pandemic. And here, the facts unequivocally show that he was compelled to do so. So it has, um, I guess, requires us to take an objective, objective look on whether this was actually a choice by the individual or not? I, I think you could say that, yes, Your Honor. So here, Mr. Mahiwe was compelled by his serious health condition and by the fact that his employer in the state of Arizona had any physically, physical distancing um, or mass, sorry, mass requirements at the time to quit his job due to COVID-19. The second reason During, that, After he uh, quit, didn't Uber put in place mask requirements? They did later on, that's correct, Your Honor. Did he go back to work then? He, I, I'm, he did not go back to work until later on in the pandemic. After he got his vaccination? That's correct. And do we know how long it was? And was it before the hearing that he had gone back to work? The, I'm sorry. Was it before the hearing that he had gone back to work or was it after the hearing? Right subsequent to the hearing, in, in, in between the hearing and when he submitted his appeal to the appeals board is when he returned to work. Oh, so at the time of the appeals board, he was actually working. That's, cor that's correct. His own uh, appeals petition to the board shows um, he submitted pay stubs where he had gone back to work at that time. Counsel, can you clarify, was he employed by Uber or was he self-employed? It, was he an independent contractor? He is self-employed. He's a gig worker, um, independent contractor. He's an Uber partner. Um, but to that point, Your Honor, um, even as an independent contractor, he did not ha have the power to say to every single rider who shows up, you have to put on a mask to get into my cab without losing a significant amount of income. The power rested with the employer, or with, with Uber, the, the, the parent company, and they did not make a move um, to protect their, their partners at that point. This is not gonna shock you, but I'm not an Uber driver, and but I was under the impression that Uber drivers could refuse work. I mean, if they pulled up and saw a, a completely drunk individual, that they could say, no, you're not getting in my car. That's, yeah, that's <coughs> correct, Your Honor. Couldn't, they done in this, couldn't he do this in this case? 
He could have done it in that case, but he, the way that Uber works, he would have to drive to a location, pick up those individuals. He would be out a significant amount of money after refusing work at that point. And Is so, there a penalty if he, if he shows up and he doesn't take the ride? I, I'm, I'm not sure how those... Is, I mean, is his loss only based on the fact that he doesn't get the income from that particular ride? Or do we know that from the record? I don't. I don't know that, Your Honor. I don't know that. So the do, we, do we know from the record even that he would have suffered a significant decrease in compensation had he required individuals to wear a mask? That is not in the record, Your Honor. The second reason that Mahiwe is... Well, what is in the record, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I thought in the record was a statement by Uber that they anticipated loss in revenue. That is in the record. That is correct. As in Uber as a company is anticipating loss. That is correct, yes. And, uh, and many Uber drivers were able to qualify under the CARES Act because of a significant diminution in income um, as a result of that. Um, so th the second reason that Mahiwe is able to qualify under the CARES Act is because he was unable to reach his employer because of a quarantine imposed due to COVID-19. Paragraph 11 of... Okay, now hold on. I thought you just told uh, Judge Brown that he was not an employee, but he was an independent contract. So is Uber his employer? Or is it Uber... Well, it's his, it's his employment. That's, that's how he was work. He was unable to perform his job because of... COVID-19. Well, as a direct result, would be under one subcategory, but I'm not sure how he can qualify it under the other category if, his, if he's not an employee of the employer. He's not an employee, right? Isn't that what you just told me? He's an independent that? contractor. So he doesn't have an employer? He, he is an independent contractor, so he, in that way, he's his own employer, but he works with Uber as a parent company. And so Uber establishes all of the regulations related to his work. I'm not sure I understand your question, Your Honor. No, that's why I just didn't. Aren't there letters from the federal government that would say this is not a qualification? That what he he's, as an Uber driver, he doesn't qualify under this this particular category. What particular category? That his employer is a, he can't reach his place of employment. No, certainly his place of employment is Uber. That's his job. And you mean the corporate headquarters? I mean, he, we're having a hard time understanding this argument because he doesn't <coughs> have an office, except perhaps a home office, I would assume. I don't know if that's, that's probably not in the record, so I shouldn't go there. But his office, so to speak, is his vehicle. Independent contractors or businesses alike were allowed to quarantine under the governor's executive order. It's not dispositive whether someone was their own employer or an independent contractor. Well, I understand, but the place of employment, that certainly can't be Uber headquarters. I mean, what, 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 what would it be? I, I, it just doesn't seem to fit, is, my, is our, my point or my concern. Is it his vehicle? His vehicle is, is certainly what he uses to, to drive. Council, um, according to the U.S. Department of Labor Unemployment Insurance Program letter number 16-20-I6, which was issued in 2021, it stated that as an, a rideshare driver, he does not have a place of employment. Okay. So if he doesn't have a place of employment, how, how could he qualify under that particular section? Because... It might be, well, he qualified under the other, other section, and you move on to a different argument? That could be, Your Honor. I, I would still maintain that he was, he was somebody who was a vulnerable adult with a serious health condition. He was unable to maintain the physical distancing of at least six feet, which was required for all businesses under paragraph 11 of governor's executive order, and that would make him fall under the purview of that prong of the CARES Act also. And, and the fact that essentially his place of employment was his vehicle um, is definitely a factor we can look at in determining whether he had to quit as a direct result of COVID because of his ability to um, implement precautions or his inability to implement precautions to protect himself from COVID, right? That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Was uh, Mr. Mahue, um able to select more than one ground um, 
for benefits when he filled out his application? And if not, what impact do you think that had on his ability to um, develop the arguments and the evidence to support his claim? Yes, the guidance from the Department of Labor says that individuals may select one or more reasons from, from among the PUA reasons. So he's able to qualify under any numerous reasons. Um, and I think at the time of his application, um, that guidance hadn't been released yet. And so I'm not, sh he was not able to select more than one reason at the time. Um, so I definitely think that had an impact on his work, on his uh, ability. Uh, I see that I have um, a limited time amount left, so I would like to move on just briefly to our arguments regarding due process, if that's okay with the court. Um, if you do not find Mahiwe eligible, Mr. Mahiwe eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance, we ask that you address his due process concerns. Um, and before I get into my argument, I'd like to remind the court why we brought this argument. And that is because a pro se litigant in response to a question from an administrative law judge about whether he had anything else to add to the record said, I'm sorry for my English. It is not my first language. So the index one, 17 out of 18 lines four through six in the record. Uh, Mr. Mahiwe himself brought this issue up expressing his own trepidation on whether he was heard and whether he was understood. The appellant himself raised the access to justice issue here. Constitutional issues may be raised for the first time on appeal where there is a matter of statewide importance. Here there is a matter of statewide importance where Mr. Mahiwe is of limited English proficiency and he struggled throughout the hearing to understand the questions or to be understand, understood by the administrative law judge. Do we rely just on your assertion of that fact? Because I've read these transcripts and for the most part, it seems like he did understand what was going on. Well, I think you can rely on the statement from Mr. Mahiwe himself, where he apologized stating that English was not his first language that statement shows that he understood that the exchanges between himself and the administrative law judge were problematic and that he, he felt he was not heard. Really? That's really what it says? To me, it says that he's apologizing for the fact that his English may, be may not be perfect, but it doesn't communicate to me, at least, that in fact he didn't believe he had been heard. Because he didn't make any attempt to, to try to clarify or or change his answers or the evidence presented. Nor did the administrative law judge ask Mr. Mahiwe, what is your first language? Or did you feel that you had an opportunity to be heard? And this constitutional issue that we're bringing is a narrow constitutional issue. It's that Ma Mr. Mahiwe, upon expressing that his trepidation over whether or not he, you know his English was good enough to satisfy the requirements of a hearing, the judge had to ask a follow-up question and the judge simply did not. Um, I'd like to conclude by just saying that at the heart of this case is access to justice. Access to justice is at issue each time we are called upon to interpret a statute. Our goal is to give effect to the legislative intent here to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. Mr. Mahiwe unequivocally qualifies for pandemic unemployment assistance where he quit his job as a direct result of COVID-19. And we ask that you find him eligible and remand his case for payment of benefits. We also ask if you don't find him eligible that you address his due process rights as access to justice requires. I'll reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. All right, thank you, counsel. Good morning and may it please the court. My name is Emily Stokes and I represent the Department of Economic Security in this matter. We're here today to review the board's decision that Mr. Mahue was not eligible for PUA benefits. But first I do want to quickly address um, the opposing parties' arguments regarding the language assistance and the fact that the record was not developed 
in her opinion. Um, in the department's brief, it did argue that she had waived these arguments, that Mr. Mehue had waived these arguments, and the department still stands by the fact that those arguments are waived. But not only are they waived, because those issues were not included in, in her petition for review to the board, this court's actually statutorily prohibited from considering those particular claims. Um, that comes from ARS 41-1993B, which is the statute that um, governs appeals from the appeal board to this court. It specifically says no issues can be raised on appeal if they were not raised before the board. This court has interpreted that statute to mean that it is prohibited jurisdictionally from considering any issue that was not raised before the board. Does the board have uh, statutory authority to decide constitutional issues? I think the board would have had an opportunity to examine the questions regarding whether or not there was a violation by not having an interpreter, um, whether or not the record was fully developed. Um, those are certainly things that were apparent, apparently, from the record, according to Mr. Mahue, right after the tribunal hearing. It's the kind of thing that could have been raised to the board, and it just was not. That really didn't answer the question. The question is, can the board decide constitutional issues? I know of nothing that says it cannot. At, at least consider whether or not um, a claimant was given the due process access to the system that it needed. So I do think these are issues that the board could have considered and um, ruled upon. But does the board have authority to consider a question like, do claimants generally um, during PUA proceedings have a due press process right to an interpreter where they're struggling uh, with language? I think at the very least, they, he could have challenged whether or not the department was, for example, following its own policy regarding having a translator and whether or not the proceeding was fair to him in not having a translator. I think those are the kinds of things that the board could have considered. That said, though, even if this court does review the issue, this record simply does not show that he, that the department did, in fact, violate his rights um, when it comes to the issue with the um, translator. What the record actually shows is that <coughs> Mr. Mahue communicated in English both written and orally. Um, the department offered him a translator when he initially applied for the hearing and he said he did not need one. In the hearing notice that the department sent him on the very first page, there's another thing that says, if you need an interpreter, call this number and we'll provide it free of charge. So it gave him two chances to let him know not only there is an interpreter, but it's free of charge. You won't have to pay for it. Just let us know that you need it. And is is that notification in the record? Yes, it's on page one. It's um, exhibit one in the record, and it's on page one of exhibit one. That's the hearing notice. But you would agree with me, counsel, if that's in English and his primary language is something else, he may not have understood. In theory, that could be true, but in this record, this record demonstrates he does know English because he wrote in English, he spoke in English, Everything he has submitted has been in English. So this record does not support that this person did not know how to read English. Well, so, and that may be true, but you wouldn't disagree with me, or maybe you would, and that's why I'm asking the question, that the ALJ still ha has an obligation, if he or she believes, that there's a, a communication barrier to inform the, the claimant that, hey, I, I think we're having troubles to here, so why don't we get a translator? I think that there may be a time where if it became apparent that the claimant truly just could not understand what was going on in the proceeding, the ALJ may have some responsibility to stop and say, do you need an interpreter? But that is not what this record shows. This record shows that he was communicating back and forth. Occasionally, he asked if she could repeat a question. Occasionally, she stopped him to say, wait, back up, let me ask you a few more questions. But there's nothing in this record to show that he had um, no concept of what was going on, that he didn't understand the questions being put to him, and that he wasn't able to understand them enough to answer back. This record does not show that this person um, needed or even wanted an interpreter. It's important to note that before the hearing began, the ALJ asked again, do you have any questions about the proceedings before we proceed? He did not ask for an interpreter then. And then even at the end, when he explained that English was not his first language, he still did not say, you know, I need an interpreter. I've really struggled to explain myself. And he didn't even, in the petition for review to the board, say, I think the fact that I couldn't speak English very well is the reason why I wasn't able to present my case. 
That simply just isn't in this record. And so even if this court was to review this claim, nothing in this record shows that the department, um, even if he has a due process right to an interpreter, withheld that from him um, or that it, it, it made him so he could not meaningfully participate in this proceeding. Do you know, are you aware of any authority saying or suggesting that he would not have a due process right? What I'm suggesting is I could not find a case directly on point that says in a civil proceeding someone has a due process right to an interpreter. Um, there are criminal cases that mention that it may be a it may be appropriate in a situation where it's clear in the record that the person does not understand what's going on. There may, without conceding, there may be a due process right to an interpreter, but even if there was, this record shows that the department met its obligations because it gave him that opportunity to have the interpreter and to meaningfully participate in his hearing by offering him interpreter services multiple times and letting him know it would be free of charge. So I do believe, but, uh, uh, and I I don't disagree w with that point. But at the same time, since the department takes the position that we will give you an interpreter free of charge, it seems to me that the department is recognizing there may be a due process argument that do you have a right to have an interpreter present? Well, I think what the department is doing is it's recognizing that under Title VI and the regulations that federal agencies have made regarding Title VI that it is required to have an LEP policy, a limited English proficiency policy. And so its policy is keeping in consistency with Title VI's regulations. Um, it may also then be a due process issue, but I don't even think this court necessarily needs to reach that issue because this particular fact pattern doesn't show that he was denied meaningful access to this hearing because of a lack of an interpreter. Now, I did want to get to the actual PUA eligibility grounds. Um, Mr. Mahue has identified two grounds under which he believes that he is entitled to benefits. One is the ground regarding an inability to get to work because of a government stay-at-home order. Um, the department's position, it's very clear that he is not covered under that ground for some reasons that this court already identified and that he doesn't really have a place of employment. His car is his place of employment and he was able to get there. But more importantly, he, when we look at the facts of this case. Why, why does his car being the place of employment take him out from that particular ground? Just quite literally, he's able to get to his place of employment and it is his car. So there's nothing in the stay at home order necessarily preventing him from getting to his car. But more importantly, the issue is the stay-at-home order, first of all, didn't go in, into effect until, I think, March 30th, and he stopped working on March 11th. So right off the bat, when he actually stops working, that has nothing to do with the stay-at-home order. But secondly, the stay-at-home order specifically says you may leave your home to perform essential functions, and a different executive order explains execu essential functions includes transportation services, and it specifically says this includes Uber drivers. So quite literally, there is nothing about the stay-at-home order that requires him not to go to work. And the way the Department of Labor has interpreted this ground, to be covered, you would have to essentially have to violate a stay-at-home directive or order um, in order to be covered under this ground. And there's nothing here that shows he would be violating the stay-at-home order had he gone to work as an Uber driver. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So he would not be covered under this ground. Um, the other ground that he has identified is ground I, which is that the individual had to quit his or her job as a direct result of COVID-19. The department does believe that um, this ground has a much narrower application than um, claimant is giving it. The Department of Labor makes it clear that the connection between COVID-19 and the reason you quit has to be an immediate result. It can't be a series of events that led you to quit. So the examples in the Department of Labor letters are that the prime example they get is if you're a person who once had COVID-19. We're not bound by the Department of Labor letters, right? The department certainly is bound to follow them. And I believe that this court is instructive when trying to find out what the law means. This court's job, obviously, is to apply the law and to apply it correctly and so to that extent I do think that they are certainly very persuasive and 
at the very least, the department is bound to follow. Your reading, your reading of that particular subsection would eliminate it entirely. Because every, everything you've, co you've commented on would, would fall within a different subsection. So you, you've simply eliminated it a, a, as a basis to, to claim that you're subject to PUA benefits. I disagree. I think, so what this section is for, again, the, the example that is given is that you had COVID, you now no longer have it, but because of lingering symptoms and side effects of COVID, you're now unable to do your job. That's a very direct effect from COVID to no longer being able to work because you literally cannot work because you're now experiencing a side effect of COVID. One other example that they give in change five, which I know council did cite in the reply brief, is a parent who has to stay home from work because their child's school is closed because of a COVID-19 order. That person might also fall under this ground. But again, the important thing there is that that particular parent has no choice. Even if they wanted their child to go to school, there'd be no school to send the child to. They could get a babysitter if they had the means to hire a babysitter. Well, oh, you've gone right to the next part. You've gone to something, uh, another part, and some other benefit. I'm saying, if he says, I have asthma, I'm 60 years old, these are criteria that under the C CDC guidelines, I should avoid contact with the outside public. You're saying, oh, no, no, no. If you want to survive and have money, you still have to get in that car, you still have to drive, and you still have to have people get in your car. And we're, talk, we're talking about March of 2020, at the very onset of the pandemic, when no one, we didn't know anything about COVID. People were extremely scared. Um, I know. So what I would argue to that is there's actually a ground for the situation you've just described. If he has asthma, which I'm not challenging that he does, he supports- No, because the board found he did. He does, right. So and the board also found he was 60. <laughs> And right. the board also found that he quit because he was 60 with asthma, right? Those are the factual findings that we that we are bound by. Yes. And then there, it's the legal conclusion of whether that meets the criteria. Right. There's a ground that covers that issue, though. If he had to leave because his health put him at risk of exposure to COVID, ground G is what would cover that. And Congress has made it very clear, um, or exact, sorry, ground F. Ground F is the one that basically says, if you have this kind of a health condition and it's putting you at risk and you need to make sure that you're not exposed to COVID, you can qualify for PUA, but you have to quit at the advice of a medical expert. You can't on your own just decide, well, here's what the CDC guidelines say and I'm gonna just choose to follow them. The, the Department of Labor guidelines are very clear that you actually have to be advised by a medical advisor. If you, without having been advised by a medical health advisor to self-quarantine, an individual who does not go to work due to general concerns about exposure to COVID-19 and who is not eligible under any other ground is not eligible for PUA. It doesn't make sense that Congress would create a ground for this type of situation, having a health, an elevated health risk, but then allow people to get outside or get around that doctor's advice requirement by allowing them to use ground I to shoehorn their claim there because it doesn't quite fit in the claim that actually exists for that situation. I, I, um, I pulled the department's petition for review in Simmons and in the petition, page three, the department takes the position that someone could qualify under II um, if there was medical advice to self-quarantine, and I think that's what you're referring to now, or other circumstances that leave the employee no reasonable choice but to stop working. I, that is broader than just the quarantine or the medical advice um, situation that you're discussing. And I'm wondering how uh, the claimant here did not qualify under other circumstances that leave the employee no reasonable choice but to stop working. When in March of 2020, having just come off a bout of asthma and being 60 years old, he's saying, I don't want to get into a vehicle with strangers who might give me this virus that we don't know much about. I understand why he made the decision he made, but there's a difference between making a decision and then being eligible for PUA. Your case has to fit into one of these fact patterns. Um, but that didn't answer his question. His question was, based on what you said in, in the petition for review in Simmons, he would qualify. If a doctor had told him to quarantine. No, that's not what you said in Simmons. Other circumstances that leave the employee no reasonable choice but to stop working. I guess, so what we have to look to then under a view, for example, like in Simmons, 
if all Mr. Mahoue has to show is that he's a service industry worker and he's at elevated risk of getting COVID, but he doesn't have a doctor's order, under that theory, basically any service industry worker could quit and apply for PUA. That's too broad and expansive a definition. I think what's really important and a difference between this case and Simmons, in Simmons, there's an issue where um, the employer was encouraging people to come into work while sick, was not enforcing mask policies, and he had tried to adjust the grievance, and there was he was getting nowhere with it, and so he found compelled to quit. That's <coughs> essentially. I mean, I think we can say he's 60 years old. He has a documented um, evidence that he was just coming off of a bout of asthma. It's an underlying health condition. The nature of, of his job is he um, works in a vehicle in close proximity to folks where there's no mass mandate at the time, and we're talking about March of 2020. And I don't know. I don't think that opens the floodgates. The department's position, even at that time, again, we're not saying that this man should have to go to work if it's going to put his health at risk. But to qualify for PUA, he needs to look at these grounds. There's a ground that specifically covers that issue and requires a doctor's note or a doctor's recommendation, and he, he didn't get it. If we were to interpret ground I as saying that his situation can apply there, it essentially makes ground G a nullity. There's no point to having that requirement that someone in his situation at least needs to get the advice of a doctor before he quarantines. Well, I think it's the other way around, because if, if, if you're a 23-year-old with slight asthma conditions and you're concerned, I think that's a different scenario that may require a doctor's note or a doctor's recommendation. But when you're sick, you've just come off a bout of asthma which required you to take time off from work, and you're working as a gig driver where you have no control over the people that get into your vehicle, that's a different scenario, isn't it? Not the way these regulations are written. The scenario... Well, actually, the regulations are written that he only has to self-certify. The regulations say you need to self-certify, but what's important in this particular case is right on the face of the self-certification, the facts don't add up to what he's self-certifying. He said that he had to stop working because of government-imposed quarantine order, but then also on the same application says, I'm an Uber driver and I quit three weeks before the stay-at-home order went into effect. On the face of it, this application has an inconsistency. The, the department had reasonable suspicion at that point to suspect that this person may not be eligible for benefits. But was he, was he allowed to select more than one option? At that time, I don't believe so. But at the very least, it gave the department the opportunity to look into the facts and do a little more fact-finding to make sure that he was actually eligible for benefits. Because the Department of Labor has made it clear, even though there are some flexibilities during COVID, the department still has to make sure that only people eligible for PUA benefits actually get them, and that the department has an obligation to do some additional fact-finding if it sees reasonable suspicion of either, either fraud or that there might be some sort of an improper payment. And so right on the surface, in this particular fact pattern, what he certified and then the facts that he gave, they didn't add up. It so gave why was he paid benefits? I mean, isn't this a flaw of the department in paying out billions of dollars, presumably, in benefits and then cr trying to claw back two years later? Uh, I mean, th this is the situation we're in. Why, why couldn't a person look at that application that if you say it's so clear, why in the world were, were benefits paid? I can't directly speak to that. What I can say is the PUA program was in implemented, had to be implemented very quickly. The department was doing the best it could. It sent out those monetary determination letters first and then would, some t and then would check to make sure. The, the monetary determination letter even says, you're eligible provided that you meet the other requirements of the CARES Act. And so I think they did somewhat of a two-step process to get benefits to people quickly, but then to still have these integrity functions to make sure that only people entitled to them would get them. And there is a provision to um, Didn't receive department, an overpayment. And on that, on that criteria about not being able to get to your place of employment, didn't the Department of uh, Labor's letter come af after the fact? It, it was not issued in March of 2020. It was issued in 2021. It did. And I think what the bigger issue here is just that because he's an Uber driver and because of when he quit, the stay-at-home order could not have been the reason that he had to quit. That would not have required him to quit. I think that's what the issue is. And so with that, I'll just add and say we believe that 
a reasonable interpretation of this record and substantial evidence does support the board's position that Mr. Mahoue was not entitled to benefits, and we would ask the court to affirm the board's decision. Thank right. you. Thank you, counsel. Any final word? <clears throat> Your Honor, just briefly, I'd like to address a couple of points made by counsel. Mr. Mahoue was not required to have a doctor's note. He could self-certify because of his health condition and because of the governor's order that he quit driving because of COVID-19. As to the department's point about their Title VI of the Civil Rights Act violations, the department has a continuing obligation to ensure that limited English proficiency claimants have meaningful access. And because of that, the judge had a duty to at least follow up with Mr. Mahoue and make sure that he felt that he was heard. Again, the fundamental requisite of due process is the opportunity to be heard. And because of those items, Your Honor, I'd also like to address briefly our second due process argument in our brief, which was development of the record. Here, the record was not developed by the administrative law judge. Employment Security Commission v. Daughtry requires, where circumstances warrant, the administrative law judge to take more than a passive role. Here, the administrative law judge didn't even ask about the Executive Order 2020-18 and the claimant's own stated reason for PUA eligibility, didn't ask whether he had a medical note, didn't ask a series of questions that they should have asked in order for the record to be developed further. Again, we would ask that you find him unequivocally eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance as a result of his quit being a direct result of COVID-19. However, if you do not find, we ask that you address his due process rights. Thank you. You and your colleagues are representing the claimant here pro bono, correct? Yes, we are. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. All right, the matter is deemed submitted. We'll issue a decision in due course. Court is in recess. Thank you.